Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news podcast. Please don't forget there's a donate button at the top of the webpage. Amid accusations that Jeremy Corbyn did not vigorously enough uh, repress, investigate, accusations of anti-Semitism against the Labour Party while he was leader. Corbyn has now been suspended both from the caucus in Parliament and from the party itself. Now joining us to give us some context to all of this is Professor Leo Panich. He's an emeritus distinguished professor of research at York University and he's the author of a new book with Colin Lees, Searching for Socialism, the Project of the Labour New Left from Ben to Corbyn. So, so Leo, explain to us what's happened, and then we'll get into why. Well, uh, this has been coming for some time. The Labour Party agreed, when Corbyn was still leader, uh, to cooperate with an investigation of the handling of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party uh, by the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission, which was set up under Tony Blair. Uh, uh, back in 2007. It was an amalgam of three agencies, disability rights and racial, the Racial Equality Commission. Uh, but it, it's mostly existed under the Tories because Labour was defeated in 2010. And uh, it, it uh, reported uh, that uh, the Labour Party had not treated this problem seriously enough uh, said there were a couple of cases of explicit harassment uh, of Jewish people, uh, and that Corbyn's leadership office had obstructed the investigation of some dozen of cases or so. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to know where to begin with this. The commission itself is very poorly funded. Uh, its first uh, chair was very close to Tony Blair. Uh, its current chair uh, is a lawyer who's been very, very close to uh, uh, Israel and the Israeli campaign. Uh, so uh, that is not to say in any sense that there wasn't a problem with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, uh, which pre-existed Corbyn, of course, uh, although it's not the kind of anti-Semitism that you think of when you think of swastikas being painted on a synagogue or a Jewish cemetery being torn down. It's mainly stuff on Twitter uh, and it reflects uh, intemperate language, usually having to do with Zionism. Uh, and often the people who are accused of being anti Semitic are Jews uh, because there's a long tradition on the Jewish left of seeing the Zionist project as narrowly nationalist, as associated with either British or American imperialism, and of course, most importantly, as dispossessing the Palestinians of their own homeland. Uh, uh, but sometimes uh, Zionism is used as equivalent with racism. Zionism is a racist project, etc. And even someone like me, a Jew who was brought up in a labor Zionist household, went to a Yiddish labor Zionist parochial school uh, for my first seven years of schooling, uh, I find that hurtful. Uh, although I understand, and of course, I think most people who take these intemperate positions understand, uh, that what this is really about, uh, and what hurts so many Jews in Britain, and in the United States and elsewhere, uh, is their strong identification with Israel. Uh, and they're becoming upset when Israel is criticized uh, uh, very strongly as being racist uh, or imperialist. Uh, and, and, you know, if someone said today that the United States was a racist society, very many liberals would buy into this. Uh, but a lot of Jewish people take that as an assault. On top of all of this, 
There's no doubt that the Netanyahu government responded to the boycott and divestment campaign and responded to what became common language uh, in the last few decades as the prospect of a two-state solution became more and more distant. Uh, responded to the language that Israel was racist, uh, that Zionism was racist, etc. The Israeli government has responded by trying to brand all criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic. Uh, so this is lies at the source of this. But what really needs to be stressed is that a poll was done by Servation asking after all of this hullabaloo that's gone on uh people how how many anti-semites they thought there were in the labor party and they said they thought a third of the labor party members were anti-semites which at that point would have been two hundred thousand people which even that's not to say anti-semitism isn't a problem in british society or elsewhere but that really would have been scary isn't this because these people define anti-Semitism as criticism of any criticism of Israel? Yes, uh, not only, but yes, very largely. But the important point here is that the total number of cases that have been brought to the Labour Party alleging anti-Semitism comes to less than 2,000, which at most is 0.3%. That is a third of 1% of the party membership, right? That's what's really significant. So one needs to put this in the context of what has been a scare campaign directed at Jeremy Corbyn used by the labor center and labor right against him because he always has stood for Palestinian rights. And, and they have used this as the battering ram most of them are not Jews, uh, but they've used this as the battering ram to, to, to tarnish him. And it relates to his anti-imperialist stand throughout his whole career, he joined the Labour Party. Is there any analysis of the whatever few hundred complaints, how many of those complaints were actually based on defining criticism of Zionism as racist? And, 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 and were there complaints about anti-Semitism that weren't connected to criticism of Israel? Yes. Uh, I can't give you the exact figure, but yes. A good many of them, however, was that someone said, and would be hauled up for this, by saying this isn't as big of a problem as you think it is. We're hauled up for saying, uh, this is being blown out of proportion. Well, that's what Corbyn was suspended for, because he that's said what Corbyn it's being, was suspended for. for just so saying it's people, exaggerated. They, they were accused of being racist for saying that anti-Semitism was not as big of a problem in the Labour Party. That was a very common accusation. Now, I think it's very important that people understand that Jeremy Corbyn has been, it, someone went through his whole career and listed this. He led 130 campaigns, protests, motions in parliament, demonstrations against anti Semitism in Britain, even before he was a Labour MP. In fact, I remember him leading one in the north of London against the Nazis who went into a Jewish community in North London, and Corbyn led the campaign against them. What they were getting him on was that his position has always been a two-state solution. Israel has a right to exist, but the Palestinians have a right to a state. And at the 1918 party conference, he made a brilliant speech, the leader's speech to the conference, the front end of which he said, I want to say to the Jewish community, I've stood in defense of you and your rights, and for your protections all my life, and I will continue to do so, I give you my utter word. Later in the speech, when he got to foreign policy, he said, I support Israel's right to exist, uh, I support a two-state solution, 
And one of the first things I will do is recognize a Palestinian state when I become prime minister. This is a red bull to these people. Uh, and he was seen as a security threat for his criticism of NATO, for his defense of Venezuela, for his you know, lifelong criticism of American imperialism, etc. The battering ram that they could use against him was this, it being presented as this vile act. Now, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has not investigated the Tory party for Islamophobia and racism. And anti-Semitism, I'm quite sure no, if they look. <laughs> of course. Uh, Boris Johnson, in the middle of all of this, you know, back in 2018, uh, derided women who wear burqas. Never would have heard anything from any of these people deriding an old Jew in a talus uh, or for wearing a kippah. It's inconceivable. And the real sickening aspect of this is that if anybody would be out there defending against racism in Britain, including anti-Semitism, it would be the left. It would be this left. It always has been, and it would be. Uh, and, and, you know, what can one say about the irony uh, of, of what's gone on here? The new leader of the Labour Party, why would he take such action now? Like if, if they had just, that Corbyn's already not the leader anymore, but by this extra step of suspending Corbyn, both the caucus, the party, it inflames a, a, a war within the Labour Party because well, much of, much or even most of the Labour Party aren't going to like this. It's going to weaken the party and, and it's not like it's going to win them a lot of votes because I'm quite sure most people in Britain honestly couldn't give a shit. Certainly most people in the North, where Labour lost a lot of its seats, its traditional working class constituency, couldn't. That's true, although, you know, people have been giving their marching orders by the media for four or five years over this. So when you ask now in opinion polls, yeah, over half, over half of the British population thinks the Labour Party is anti-Semitic. Uh, he has made it his policy uh, to prove to the British establishment and to the British media, the BBC not least, and the Guardian not least, that he as leader of the Labour Party is loyal to the British state. So tell us a little bit about Keir Starmer. He's Sir Keir Starmer. So what's his story, the new leader of the Labour Party? Well, he, his first name is, is uh, the name of Keir Hardy, the first leader of the Labour Party in Britain. Uh, he was a lawyer, a human rights lawyer, uh, uh, became the leading prosecutor for the British state, uh, and worked closely with the IR in, in, in prosecuting the IRA, the British state. Uh, he took the lead and he's a middle, he's been a middle of the road kind of guy, you know, not socialist, but laborist. Uh, he only got elected uh, in, in uh, 2015 when Corbyn became leader, uh, just before Le Corbyn became leader. Uh, and he wasn't, you know, bothered being in, in Corbyn's cabinet. And if anything, he would have been seen as providing it with some cover. He was given the Brexit portfolio. Uh, and uh, he managed to walk the tightrope between the side of the Labour Party that thought the, you know, they did very well in the 2017 election. In fact, they increased Labour's vote for the most that any party had increased its vote since 1945 in that election. Uh, when it said, we accept Brexit, a referendum was held. Uh, and and uh, we accept that as a democratic decision. And they did extremely well in that election, and most people thought he was going to go on to be prime minister. After that, uh, he went along with the attempt by the labor right to revive the notion, and most of the media, of a the need for a second referendum. And this split the Labour Party, uh, and Corbyn decided to accommodate this. 
a number of MPs resigned. We all said they were going to form a new party unless Labour clearly came out and put the case in favor of a second referendum and to abide by it, etc. And Starmer played both sides of this, but he played a crucial role in the disastrous uh, campaign that Labour ran on Brexit, especially for its working class voters, which was if we get elected, we will call a second referendum. And Corbyn would not commit to say that he would abide by that referendum because he was trying to hold on to working class voters. So it made him look tongue-tied, and he was tongue-tied. Uh, so Starmer was responsible in good part for this, although the pressure was coming from those further to the right. I mean, he's not a Blairite, uh, but he is, you know, what do you, traditional. What, what do you mean by that? Well, the Blairite, you know, the Blair-Clinton type of ideology. Let's fully embrace neoliberalism uh, and global capitalism. You know, let's not present ourselves as a class party, even though what is Labour Party with its trade union base, but a class party. But also, Clinton was doing that, not passing the labor legislation that they promised the AFL-CIO, et cetera. It's much easier for the Democratic Party, of course, because there's no organic link with the unions. There's a financial link, but in the, it's constitutional in the British Party. Anyway, so he's not that. But what's most important about him having become leader, despite the fact that when he ran, he pledged to keep Corbyn's policies, is that his top strategy has been to accommodate the British media to prove that the Labour Party is a responsible opposition and would form a mainstream government. We may see this with Biden, but certainly in the Labour Party case, this is what is happening. And therefore, the policy was, since the media was constantly saying, if anyone says this is overblown, this is itself a proof of anti-Semitism. He laid down the law, and the commission takes that position. He laid down the law that no one is alive to say it's overblown. So Corbyn made a statement yesterday in which he said, if we have one anti-Semite in the Labour Party, it's one too many. I agree we didn't do a good enough job on education. We should have done much more, right? Uh, I accept this is a problem in the party. I want to say, I think this has, people have the impression that this is a much more general thing in the Labour Party than it really is. That's what they got him on. But behind all of this is to vomit out the fact that for the first time in its history, at least for four years, except for four years in the 30s, that the Labour Party was actually led by committed socialists, committed anti-imperialists, maybe even more important for them. Because really what the test for these guys are is the American alliance. That's their definition of respectable politics. And that's what this is fundamentally a message about, that right. with, with Israel as the litmus test, a labor government will not break with the traditional fundamental global strategy of the Anglo-American alliance, even if they'll try to do some domestic reforms that are more social democrat than certainly the conservatives will bring in. That's absolutely right. So does this lead to a, a, a more of and even a massive split within the Labour Party or, or what, what happens to forces question. like mo momentum and these kinds of people that were, I mean, it wasn't all, it wasn't, it wasn't all about Corbyn. It was about a whole movement. Very good question, Paul. Uh, you know, my position in all my work on the Labour Party has been that you can't change an elephant into a gazelle that there always have been socialists in the Labour Party, and there always will be. But the nature of that party is such that the attempt to turn it into a socialist party would split it. Uh, and that those who define themselves 
as not being socialists, uh, who are the majority, as socialism being a stupid illusion. Uh, they are the majority and always have been in the Parliamentary Labour Party, who are made up of career politicians. Even if they start as socialists, they end up in that position, most of them. Uh, and, and it would split the Labour Party and a divided party can't win elections. The Labour left always takes unity on its own shoulders, not the Labour right. They see solidarity holding the labor movement together as the top principle. These guys, at least enough of them, doesn't have to be a majority, are prepared on the night of the election to come out against the labor left. Uh, and, and so, does this prove that my position was right, that you can't change the labor party? Because after all, unbelievably, Jeremy Corbyn, the uh, inheritor of Tony Benn's mantle um, and the most, you know, consistent of the democratic socialists in the back bench of the party, suddenly becomes leader after 2015 and draws in literally hundreds of thousands of young people into the party. The trouble was the base for that hadn't been laid. Momentum was only created out of Corbyn's campaign for the leadership. The unions, were, the left unions, were very important in funding Corbyn's campaign, but they're largely depoliticized even if they have a left-wing union leadership. So, you know, normally the way to have gone about this would have been to change the base of the party, to change the party apparatus, then to elect a socialist leader. Instead, you had... Corbyn and, you know, the four leading MPs around him, uh, who had their own limitations and faults as politicians, uh, as, as, as socialist politicians, uh, you know, sitting uh, in a sense over a machine that they couldn't control. Uh, and with people in the party machine who had been appointed by Blair who were determined to do everything they could to embarrass him, to get rid of him, uh, including for the first two years, the general secretary of the party. Okay, what happens now? Look, the, there is no alternative in a way, what, you know, what appears to be the case with the attempt by socialists in the 21st century to found new socialist parties is that even where they've been successful, and they've only been successful in proportional representation systems, where you can get a foothold inside the state with 5% of the vote, 10% of the vote, et cetera, which can't happen in first past the post electoral system. Right? Those parties are now, they got in, Syriza, Podemos, the Linka in Germany, uh, uh, Bloco in, in Portugal, they are all in coalition governments with social democratic parties. And the great movement has occurred with the DSA and the Democratic Party behind Sanders and with momentum and much more than momentum behind Corbyn and the Labour Party. Both of those have now run their courts. And the question will be whether they're going to continue inside the working on the, the Democratic ticket in the United States and inside the Labour Party, which is a real membership party, which the Democratic Party isn't, uh, uh, in Britain. A lot of people will leave, have already left, when Starmer became leader. Uh, and, and I hear Momentum's membership is down significantly as well. This will lead other people to leave. On the other hand, there's nowhere really to go. They will be, you know, individuals in the ether. Uh, there's no base, there's no coherent organization here, and it's still a first past the post system. Moreover, the left MPs and the left union leaders are, you know, they're making a bit of a stink about Corbyn's suspension. Uh, but some of a lot of them are saying, well, he shouldn't have said that. 
In other words, you should have known that this was a setup. Uh, and, and right now, Momentum is running, or was it an hour ago, a mass meeting online that had 4,000 people online on this, where a leading leader of Unite, the largest union in Britain, was speaking, uh, where uh, a, a leading left labor MP spoke himself, half Jewish, et cetera, where a leading black campaigner spoke, all of them condemning anti-Semitism fully. Uh, but trying to, you know, defend Corbyn. Uh, I think you're not going to see a split. Uh, uh, the ground just has not been laid. I fear because of this, the left will regroup as momentum, unfortunately, was too much oriented to, to being a Jeremy Corbyn cheerleading group. And that's not the way forward. Corbyn was there, he did what he did, but what is needed is a renewal of the labor left with a very clear campaigning orientation, an orientation to get into working class constituencies and begin to remake the working class as a social force, which is not. Having some class identity and class consciousness uh, of a progressive kind. And, and I think if it ends up being a defense of Jeremy Corbyn, or at least gets, you know, turned in that direction for a year or two, that very badly delays that more important initiative. You know, it's, it, it may have been the case eventually that such momentum and others who did try to do this would get expelled from the Labour Party once they were successful at it. Well, that's, you know, that, that's better because they've already built a base, right? But were they to walk away now, they'd have no, you know, no strength. But you're not suggesting they shouldn't oppose and have, there's a whole campaign now in solidarity with Corbyn. You're seeing that in the United States to some extent. You're not suggesting people shouldn't do that. You're just talking, you don't build a whole strategy around that in terms of the Labour Party. One has to do this. Absolutely, but there's a cost to it. There's a political cost to it. I mean, it can't be avoided, but there's a political cost to it in terms of long-term strategy, which needs to begin immediately. You don't leave it for the long term. It needs to begin now, or you won't get it, ever get it done. What's the political so, cost? The political cost is that you your efforts and energies get oriented into getting Corbyn's membership reinstated. Where's that taking you? I mean, it's good, but it doesn't change the Labour Party. I think one of the things that needs to be done, perhaps more than was done, and this feeds into what you're talking about, you know, the, the, the class and other people become more conscious. But if there's going to be a Labour Party that's going to really be transformative, the, the part of the groundwork is to lay the groundwork of breaking with the Anglo-American alliance, that the UK should not be part of the policies of the American empire. A lot of the pundits who supported Corbyn, Paul Mason and others, take the exact opposite position, that we should leave foreign policy aside, we shouldn't touch it. What we're aiming at is the end of austerity social democratic policies inside Britain, we will be uh, killed before we can do that if we raise the foreign policy stuff. I think they're wrong, I agree with you. Uh, but you know, that's the other side of this. Uh, and and uh, you, know, you see the difficulty here. Uh, it, you know, it really is very tactically, very, very difficult. Where are things at now? The, the pandemic is getting worse in the UK, it's ravaging Europe again. Uh, unemployment's gonna get deeper, depression's gonna get deeper. You would think the hold of the Tory party on power is, is gonna get shakier. Yeah, but uh, they, have a mass, they have a massive majority. So, you know, we're talking election five years from now. Uh, so people are constantly looking at the polls, and Starmer is trying to prove himself electable. But, you know, there's no reason to think that's going to happen quickly. 
uh, you know, maybe Boris will so screw up uh, that there'll be a coup in the in the Tory party. Uh, but you know that won't lead to an imminent election unless they're sure they'll win it. Uh, so uh, I don't think that's an immediate concern. And and everybody who's looking at the tea leaves and the opinion polls around whether Starmer has you know whether his rating has gone up or not in the estimation of the population, uh, whether they've closed the gap on the Tories or not, they haven't very much in the opinion polls. You know, it really, I'm not sure that this really tells you very much. There are going to be a lot of people on in the center left, as there will be with a Biden leadership. And, and I certainly would and have uh, stressed the importance to socialists of voting for Biden, campaigning for him, et cetera, in a popular front kind of way, given the alternative. Uh, but there will be a lot of people who will say, look, the important thing is for labor to get in again. And if the only way we can get in is with this type of mainstream politician, let's have it. And that leads us nowhere precisely in terms of what you're talking about. Yeah, it leads you know, back to, that, back that, to Blair. The nature of capitalism today, does, these guys can't manage the contradictions yeah. of, of this irrational system. Uh, as Obama could. Uh, so, you're right. Uh, I think this is a losing strategy. I have to say, on a positive note, and we probably should end on this positive note, that you see uh, when you get on Momentum and watch their you know, cyber campaign tonight, all these young speakers, when you talk to the people who founded Momentum, all very young people, three of them Jews, by the way. Well, two of the three were young. One was very old. Um, uh, you see the remarkable talent, commitment, and intelligence of a new generation of socialists. Really, it's quite breathtaking. And that is the positive thing. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll be stuck in the Labour Party for the most part for a while. Uh, but they can do good things within that framework and have every intention of not getting trapped in internal politics and building outward, uh, you know, forcing Starmer to get rid of all of them, which would be cutting off his nose to spite his face in terms of talent. Uh, so, you know, we'll have to see. But the hope is those remarkable people who came into the party, uh, either just before Corbyn uh, or just after. All right. Thanks for joining us, Leo. Glad to be here, Paul. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news podcast. And don't forget the donate button at the top of the website.